publish the uh, new uh, Bisoros newsletter, which is a triannual new newsletter. In the Bisoros uh, newsletter, uh, we will regularly publish the articles related to avian ecology uh, as well as the all uh, envis related activities. Also, we will uh, regularly update our database. Uh, it also uh, it uh, it included the uh, research uh, related to birds. Again, uh, we are working on the grid-based decision support system. Uh, we have also uh, developed the mobile application based on bird identification. We will release this app as early as possible. Uh, thank you, thank you, Gargi. Uh, yeah. Thank More you, sir. You. Yeah. yeah. Okay, to tell you all about a bit about Bombay Natural History Society, I don't think the society needs an introduction, but still, uh, we are one of the oldest uh, natural history organizations. As you can see, it was established in 1883. That is almost 139 years of work. And it's a pan-India wildlife research organization that is throughout India. And we have also collaborated with a lot of organizations abroad. Uh, so the mission of BNHS is basically to <clears throat> work in conservation through research, education and public awareness. As we know, everything goes hand in hand. And our vision is basically to become a uh, scientific organization with a excelling, um, what do you say, work in conservation of threatened species and habitats, but also keeping in mind about other species, because as you know, an eco ecosystem is made up of different species. So we also work on non-threatened species. It's not just about threatened species. And we have so many projects going on currently. And uh, <clears throat> the assets that we have in our main head office in Mumbai are publications. Uh, we also publish a lot of uh, articles research articles and we also have our own journal called JBNHS and uh, we have a huge library that is an asset to us and collections where we also give researchers and upcoming budding naturalist uh, specimens to work on their research so that's what we have in our head office and if you are ever in Bombay and come to visit please do visit our center and become a member and to introduce our today's speaker so she's from Sri Lanka I'm very happy today to introduce her because it's really exciting to meet somebody from other country and collaborate. Her name is uh, Ms. Gayomini Panagoda. And here you can see she's holding a crab clover. So basically, she has done her bachelor's in environmental conservation and management from University of Kelania. And during her bachelor's, uh, she focused on human monkey conflict in Sri Lanka and also the usage of spatial modeling to facilitate wildlife movements. Uh, so she's an avid birder and a member of Field Ornithology Group of Sri Lanka. So basically, this is like a Sri Lankan affiliate to BirdLife International. And uh, as of now, uh, excuse me, sorry, can I please ask everybody to mute their mic, please? Thank you. So currently, she's pursuing her PhD on migration ecology of water birds. And she, she's studying that in uh, mainland Asia and Sri Lanka. And she's doing it from University of Colombo. So she conducts field expeditions. She's currently in Mannar and does a lot of bird ringing and satellite tagging activities. And obviously, because of all these things, she has won the Young Conservation Scientist Award for Bird Research by the Oriental Bird Club. So without further ado, I'm going to just hand over to our speaker for today and ask her to start with her presentation. Thank you. Gaimini, over to you. Hello, Gargi, and hello, everyone, and hello to all India, and welcome to my talk today. And before starting anything, I just want to show you something really interesting. Um, right now, I'm in Manor and standing right on top of the uh, uh, migratory entrance points to Sri Lanka. And what you see here is Udumale Madhvat. So the, in the far corner in the horizon is actually India, you know? So from here, uh, India is just 30 kilometers away. So this mud flat and the associated uh, the, the flat here is the primary field site where we do all the banding and tracking activities. So I'm so happy that on the on May 14th on the World Migratory Bird Day that I'm here in a migratory get gateway and talking to you all about the activities that we conduct here in Bana. So uh, let me share my screen. Um, wait. Um, 
हेलो हेलो also a small request to all the participants please do not uh, ask questions or talk between the presentation as a speaker uh, will be uh, attending all the questions at the end of the session so i would just request you all to you know enjoy her talk and listen to what she has to say we will surely discuss everything at the end thank you Uh, hi gayamini i think you need to unmute yourself actually i uh, transferred from my mobile phone to the laptop okay so i'll be sharing my screen now प्रेजेंटेशन मोड एंड डू इट फुल स्क्रीन देन बिकॉज राइट नाउ आई कैन सी दिंडोज एंड योर स्क्रीन I think it will be okay now. Um, hi, Gagi. All good now? Hello. hello yeah sorry i was in mute yeah we can see the screen yeah. right it's simple it's not just only just like uh there are there are noise coming coming in from other from the audience i guess yeah is it okay now see we'll try to mute whoever by mistake uh, mute, unmutes themselves uh yeah thank you okay so uh let's start Yes, please. Yes, 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 please. Okay, right. Okay, so hi again, everyone. Sorry for all these uh, disturbances. So, right. So, just as uh, according to a very nice introduction, yes, I'm Gayatri. I'm working on uh, waterbed migration ecology at Kanchi University of Colombo as a PhD student, and I work in Ghana. And yeah, today on the occasion of the World Migratory Bird Day, I'll be talking about how our birds. So, over the cities across the Central Asian highway, and how our studies that we conduct in Sri Lanka have brought light to the unknown migratory birds in our country. So, uh, in this morning, you need to give you a general introduction about the world migratory bird day. So, it's actually an awareness raising campaign that is conducted to raise. Uh, the importance to popularize the importance of migratory birds and uh, conservation of their habitats as well. And every year, it focuses on a different threat and uh, get the attention of uh, the outside world uh, to work uh, and help tackle that problem and conserve migratory birds. So this year, the theme is to focus on light pollution, and we'll be talking all about it. Before anything, uh, Gayamini, I'm sorry to disturb and interrupt. Uh, sorry, actually we have a lot of uh, people saying on the chat that they they are not, unable to hear you properly, oh, like they can't hear you. Can. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
maybe uh, just a second. Um, I tried to I try to talk louder. I think it will be okay. Um, okay. Okay, because it's it's very windy here. I have closed all the windows, but still the air is coming in. Okay. 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 Right. Okay. So uh okay, moving on. Before talking about anything else, today we have to understand what bird migration is and why birds migrate. You know, about one quarter all the world's birds do long distance migration as a response to climate and the availability of food. You know what happens in the Northern Hemisphere, so according to the seasonal changes, in the winter, the temperature drops, and then the ground and water freezes, and the food supply diminishes. So as a result of that, the birds have to, to move to a place where the food is abundant. So normally what they do is they move along the north-south pattern, just like uh, shown in this animated map, you can see that the birds are moving south now. Now, this is the fall, and during the winter, they will be in the lower latitudes, uh, especially in the tropics and the subtropics, where the food is plentiful. And then again, when the spring comes, they fly north again because the northern summer provides them better opportunities uh, for uh, rearing of their next generation, rearing their young. So every year, this goes in a cycle. Annually, they move up and down, flying along the north-south axis. So this is, there are different types of migration, but this is the most common and the most seen migration because we have more land area in the northern hemisphere rather than the southern hemisphere. So this shows you how white storks migrate from Europe to and from Europe to Africa. And every dot and line here shows a migrating white stalk, an individual. You can see now, uh, during the fall, now they are heading to South Africa and some to West Africa. And then the winter is over, the spring has come, and they are flying north again. And by the onset of summer, they'll be ready for breeding in their breeding grounds in Germany. Right, so this is how migration happens. This is just an example. Right, so you saw that the birds, the bird flew from uh, thousands of kilometers between its breeding and wintering ground annually. So the next question comes to us is, how do they this long distance migration? Or how do they navigate this accurately? So scientists have different explanations for this. And it's thought that the birds have an internal global positioning system that helps them to position themselves where they are globe. So they can help, they can sense the Earth's magnetism, and they have different organs in their body helping that starting from their eye, ear, and the lips. So they have different, uh, especially uh, the eye have a connection, uh, a, a special area of its brain, and it helps them to sense the bird's magnetism. And then the inner ear uh, of the bird is adapted to, uh, again adapted to help, uh, help them identify which way north is. And also, their DNA, their genes are programmed and tell them where to fly and for how long to fly and where to turn, where to stop, etc. It's like they're coming with an inbuilt uh, genetic Google map. So they can do the navigation so accurately. And birds large, largely migrate at night. The reason behind that is so. There are birds who migrate during the day as well, uh, like uh, most raptors and uh, uh, the insectivores. And most waterfowl, shorebirds, and uh, 
songbirds migrate at night because it helps them to have the daytime entirely for feeding and then the atmospheric structure in the nighttime helps them uh, to fly easily and of course it helps them to avoid predators that they find during the daytime. So this shows you how uh, uh, the migrating birds are captured by weather surveillance radar. Uh, from sunset to next day sunrise, how the birds move across the continental US. So we know that a lot of birds migrate at night. And moving on, so when the birds migrate, they follow specific routes. So these specific routes are collectively called a flyway. Right? Depending on the classification system, there are different flyway classification systems. So depending on the system you uh, uh, use, uh, there are three to nine global flyways has been identified. So here I have shown eight major global flyways, and here is what is important to us, the Central Asian flyway. It is to which you and I, India and Sri Lanka, South Asia belongs. So compared to the other big global flyways, they seem very small, and it's the shortest flyway of all. But actually, so this is this is the, the already the, the documented area of the Central Asian flyway, but the actual expanse uh, is bigger and it is not even properly mapped because the Central Asian flyway is the world's least studied flyway. And we also ha don't have that large sea crossing like the other flyways. We don't have large sea crossings, but we do have some of the most harshest natural barriers that exist on Earth for, for bird migration. Right? When starting from the higher latitudes, we have the, the central Siberian plateau, and then the south Siberian mountains right here, and then the steppes and deserts in Central Asia, and we also have the world's highest mountain ranges, like the Himalayas, Tian Shan, Pamir, etc. So this mountain range, this complex of mountains, stands right across the entire breadth of the Indian subcontinent. So it is important to understand this is the major wintering area of our flight. So these are the breeding grounds of our flyway that is ranging from northeastern Europe to far east Asia, right here. But still, the birds every every year, millions of birds find their way overcoming all these natural barriers. So that's how remarkable they are. And coming down our flyway. So here we here we are, Sri Lanka, the southernmost, one of the southernmost destinations of our flight. So being in this location helps us to identify, helps us to study uh, bird migration systems within our flyway. And here is Mana Island, a migratory entrance point to Sri Lanka. And this is a map developed by uh, Sri Lankan ornithologists, and it also have identified the uh, identified Bana as a migratory entrance point. But this map is based mostly on anecdotal evidence rather than strong uh, scientific evidence. But uh, what we do is staying in this migratory gateway, this Mana Island, we study bird migration and we try to characterize the Central Asian flyway from being uh, in its southernmost destination and to identify the role of Mana Island in it. So this is our team working in Mana Island and this is our field research station in Mana, the Sand Piper House. So this is where I stay in this place. And this is uh, Professor Sahat Senevira, the principal investigator of, the, of our bird migration study project in Sri Lanka and myself and our team members. And this is the, I forgot to mention, this is the Poli Island chain of Ramas, which connecting us in Mana to you in India with the Pambet Islands. And to introduce the, uh, you to Mana a bit, Mana in the northern winter becomes a heaven 
for the migrating water birds. So every year we have about 400,000 to 1 million water birds of like 120 different species. So including uh, this uh, critically endangered spoonbill sandpiper, which has been recorded here, and then the endangered great knot, and then the near threatened godbits, curlew, uh, uh, curlew sandpiper, etc. Mm. Right. So now we know that Manor is an important, crucial location to study bird migration. So before specifically talking about the studies that we conduct in Sri Lanka, I'd like to uh, discuss a little bit about how to study bird migration. So there are different uh, tools that exist uh, for studying bird migration. The most common, the simplest and the widespread uh, method is bird banding. So what happens here is each and every bird is given a color band or a metal band. In case it's a color band, it's from individual to individual. The color combination is unique. So we can track down to the individual. And if it's a metal band, mostly uh, we, for the migrating birds, we give a metal band and it carries a unique uh, unique number, an alphanumeric code with some letters and with some numbers and the address of the band. So in case uh, of Sri Lanka, it carries the DWLC Sri Lanka, Department, Department of Wildlife Conservation Sri Lanka. And uh, from band to band, the, that engraving differs. So what happens is, so there are bands scattered along the fly, and they have connections with each other. Now, when a bird flies from its original banding location to some areas, it's flying, it's flying across the flyway, right? So a band somewhere along its flyway is also banded for this banded bird. And it can, they can read the band and the, and this, the particular code and the address. So they can let us know that our bird is with them now. So likewise, we can establish two dots and build these kind of connections. So this is how a migration map is developed. So this shows such an example. This is a migration map uh, of Northern Pintail developed by the uh, Bombay Natural History Society. And okay, but Brands cannot tell us the whole story because now we can understand to get a decent number of recoveries, to get a decent number of free sightings, we have to ban like millions of birds. And then again, we will be able to draw a line between two dots, but we don't, we won't be able to understand the exact migratory pathway that it takes. So we have we have to have some advanced tools not just bird band. So that is how lead flagging came into play. Lead flagging was actually banding was started uh, to study bird migration in early 1890s and lead flagging was brought up uh, by 2000 only. And what happens in color lead flagging is each and every uh, country, and if it's a big country, each and every region is given a specific color combination. So even without uh, capturing the bird, even without reading that particular alphanumeric code, just by looking at the color combination, we know from where the bird came. So, for example, I have shown here uh, the, the color combinations that is relevant to northern in, uh, North India, South India, and Sri Lanka. North India has two white flags, South India has one black flag, and Sri Lanka has double green flags. So this is actually uh, uh, one of our first uh, leg flag birds in Sri Lanka, uh, a crab lower. And this is, uh, this is actually the reciting of it. So this was, the bird was flagged in Mana in northwestern Sri Lanka. And it was recited in southern India after traveling like 500 kilometers across the country. And this is actually a great knot that I observed right here in the mudflat that I showed you right now. And uh, this bird, this red knot was found, has been found flagged by the NHS team in India in Point Calumet last October. So we could recite the bird uh, actually 1st of January right here. And then this little sand flow, that's a sand flower, was also recited in Yala in southeastern Sri Lanka. Uh, again, uh, the Point Calumet flagged bird. 
for life, right? They can establish connections easily because the flights enhance the rate of free fighting. Not like that. The most advanced technique of all is the satellite tracking. So this is the cutting edge of the uh, migration, the migration studies. So it can tell you a whole lot of information. It can generate enormous amounts of data that we can use in uh, prioritizing population action. So this is an example uh, of uh, how a satellite tag individual can, uh, how much information a satellite tag individual can collect. So these are European honey bazaar uh, tags in Europe. It shows uh, the male and female pair, how it moves south to west and South Africa during the winter. And along the way, it clips all this information, not just its GPS location, but also its flight attitude and other environmental data and behavioral data as well. Now, in the spring, it is flying back to the north. It's crossing the Sahara Desert. And it is back in the breeding ground. The male arrives first, and then female follows behind, and both are back. So during this year, they have collected all lot of information that is unimaginable with just a bag. Right. So that is how satellite tagging can help. And these are some more examples uh, that was revealed. Uh, when examples uh, for the, uh, uh, the the findings revealed by the satellite tech. Right. We have identified some of the champion migrants uh, as a result of this technology. And this is an Arctic turn. This Arctic turn performed the world's longest migration. So every year, it travels from North Pole to the South Pole, from the Arctic to the Antarctic, flying on average, 30,000 kilometers one day. So that much distance is flies. So it has been estimated that within a, a lifespan of an Arctic turn, which is a very small bird, uh, it lives for like uh, 20 to 30 years. And within a lifespan of an Arctic turn, uh, it has been found that it travels a distance which is equal from the Earth to the three times the distance from the Earth to the moon and back. So you can imagine how remarkable abilities they have. And then this is the Bahirid group. It crossed the towering Himalayas. It is among the world's highest altitude, uh, highest flying birds. And it can go beyond Mount Everest. So easily go, uh, uh, fly about 7,000 meters, like 30,000 feet. So just like an aircraft. So it has actually specific uh, physiological adaptations uh, to, uh, to perform this kind of uh, uh, amazing journey. And it's also the world's fastest climber. And this is the bar player golf. Again, a champion flyer. It does the world's longest non-stop migration flight. So a satellite tag the individual from Alaska has been found to cross right across the Pacific Ocean to arrive in New Zealand. And it has flew for like 12,000 kilometers within one week. There is no stopping for feeding, resting, or sleeping. So that is how amazing these birds are. And so understanding, so the importance of this technology, how we can use them to tackle the problems in our flyway and to generate more information that is needed for conservation, we initiated a project along with it. We, uh, it's in the field ontology group of Sri Lanka, uh, of the University of Kalamu, along with the Research Center for Eco Environmental Sciences of the Chinese Academy of Sciences and Wetlands International, having Wetlands International also as a partner. So, we uh, initiated this project with an aim to characterize 
the least studied Central Asian flyway from its southernmost destination and to determine how, uh, determine the role of Nana Island and Greater Sri Lanka. It, so our plan is to deploy 70 tags in two phases. Actually, we uh, started tagging, satellite tagging of birds in Nana right here uh, in uh, May 2020. And so far we have tagged like 30, uh, 35 uh, individuals uh, that uh, belongs to various species, all our water birds. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the findings of uh, that was uh, revealed by uh, each and every uh, tagged individual, but I'll be focusing uh, about some important findings that we made so far. And uh, to show you, this is actually the summary of our finding in terms of global connectivity of Sri Lanka and MANA. You can see that actually MANA, actually Sri Lanka is quite the center in the in our flyways, a center uh, uh, in terms of uh, biological connectivity uh, in the globe. So you can see that birds are moving from Sri Lanka to high Arctic and even up to Europe, this is European Russia, and then birds are moving uh, north and crossing Himalaya and arriving in Tibetan Plateau to breed in the summer and there are ducks flying to northern India and we have seen we have observed flag great knots in China in Mana and our red shanks and crab lovers offers so no. so we have witnessed so throughout the past couple of years we have witnessed that other birds are traveling all over the Central Asian side, they're exploring both arms of it, the eastern and western arms. And to move actually to the theme today, the light pollution and soaring over the city. So this is about a story. This is about the migration story of our tag new green skulls. And I will tell you how they flew through, flew above our cities that is scattered along the Central Asian side on their on the way uh, to their breeding grounds in high Arctic. So uh, actually, I'm sitting in the very same place that I was sitting during this on this day. This is uh, uh, la this last year, April, uh, April four. So we are with the with our first tag Hugh Glees guy. Uh, we named from Manike. So this is our team, Kapu Sampat here, myself and our team. So this is what we found. Uh, this is actually what Manike told us from my vision story goes like this. So first, uh, in late April, she departed Sri Lanka. She was tagged in uh, early April. And first she flew across the Ramat Bridge, the capital poorly Ramat Bridge, and arrived in Point Kalinia in South Eastern India. And there, it actually stopped over for like two weeks and then moved on. Across crossing the, uh, the mainland India and hopped into the west coast from the southeast coast, and it arrived in Goa and then flew passing Mumbai. It arrived in Gujarat, and actually, it had a, a, a few days uh, stay in Fort Bandar, Gujarat, where we have uh, our friends uh, trying to spot them always, uh, and uh, then. Uh, the bird uh, the, and then Manike flew further north from Gujarat, entered Pakistan, and flew to Hyderabad, and then uh, entered Afghanistan, flew to Kandahar, and entered Uzbekistan. And here it is entering Kazakhstan. And then it's flying from Kazakhstan, and here it is arriving in southernmost Russia. And flying through the north, it found the Ob River, one of the largest rivers in Russia. And downward, it followed Ob River and ended up in Ob River estuary and going right here, which is the Yamal Peninsula, its breeding ground. So, what it did was, so it spent the, the summer, the three months, uh, May, June, July, uh, it spent here in the Yamal Peninsula. And before talking about its southward migration, uh, this is about, it's a, actually a summary uh, of the north, northward migration uh, of uh, Manikin. You can see that it went 
five long weeks to arrive in Yamal Peninsula, traveling almost 8,000 kilometers. And here you can see it is entering, she's entering European Russia. So this is Ural Mountains that, uh, that is the, uh, that separates continent Asia from Europe. So it crossed the Ural Mountains and arrived in Yamal Peninsula. And here it is the breeding ground of it. So during the summer, you can see how its movements are centered uh, on one location. So this is uh, where its nesting colony was located. And standing there three months, then it turned back. So this shows its southward migration. So interestingly, what happened was we had two uh, Huglin's gull, who tagged Huglin's gulls last year, Manike, named Manike and Megan. So what Manike did was, Manike came back, uh, mostly uh, very uh, similar to the uh, route that it, take, uh, that it took to fly north. And on the way, actually, uh, it, without crossing Afghanistan, it came through Iran. And following the same path, it arrived back in India after six months uh, and nine days after its departure from Sri Lanka. And with that, it became the first non-bird from Sri Lanka to travel all the way up to Thai Arctic and even up to Europe and then come back. But Megha did was, Megha didn't come back to Sri Lanka. It found a nice uh, spot in the west coast of India in a place called Harnai Maharashtra. I think it's, uh, I actually looked uh, in the Google map uh, and uh, in, in the Google Earth and found out that there's a nice fishing port, very similar to what he had in Salaimana. So I think uh, he picked up, uh, he, uh, he decided to stay in that place uh, for this for the next winter. And uh, so the last winter is spent in Maharashtra only uh, without coming back to Sri Lanka, uh, but Manikeri really come back. Uh, and this is actually the route that they took uh, when uh, it was flying south, uh, you can see that how it is flying back from uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, entering Kazakhstan, and how it was flying through Afghan Iran border and coming back to Gujarat. So here it's called Bandar, uh, it's one of its stop over sites. And this is uh, a full, the full migration cycle of Manikin, a summary of it. Uh, so throughout this, this is the annual cycle. So we found that uh, along this journey, it entered nine different countries of two continents, starting from Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Russia, and on the way, it also included Iran. So nine countries. It's a journey of 20,000 kilometers from here to here and back. And Luckily, Mega, I told you that Mega was wintering in Maharashtra only in Harnai. And what this was, so it continued to give us data, it's still transmitting. And this last April, on actually 1st of April, it started moving north once again. So this is the second migration cycle of Mega as a tag bird. So we could see that uh, it first went to Mumbai and just like uh, following the last year's route, and then it went to Gujarat. Uh, so actually we have uh, one of the, maybe the probably the most enthusiastic Gujarat bird, we say Ashwana, was trying to trying so hard with his friends uh, to spot our Mega, but the Mega was too fast for even them. And uh, so sadly we could not spot, spot him and Mega flew, uh, Mega continued to flew and then it went to Pakistan. Uh, it, this time it flew through Hyderabad and then through Kabul in Afghanistan and entered Uzbekistan. And by the, actually on 1st of May, in, it arrived in Kisiloda region of Kazakhstan. So Kisiloda is located just above Sirtaria River. So this is one of the longest rivers in Central Asia right now. So it is hanging around the floodplain of the Sirtaria River. So this was today's morning and this is Mega. And this time, actually, we have a new addition uh, to the to our flock of tagged huglings. So this is Mary. Mary was tagged on uh, next March only. So after being tagged, Mary moved. Uh, Mary left Sri Lanka on uh, the 
like 20th April. Again, following the same route, it first flew to Point Calumet and then crossed to uh, Goa and flying across, uh, flying along the west coast of uh, India, came to Mumbai, Gujarat, and following the same path as Megan. Now, today morning, it arrived in Uzbekistan. So, actually, this image is from today morning. So, this is, uh, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, Khatar Kurgan Reservoir in Uzbekistan. And you can see this. This is the Khatar Kurgan city of Uzbekistan. It's, uh, the reservoir is very close to the city. And, uh, yeah. So, the other, the, the Cuban girls are now kind of halfway through. So, so they will be arriving in their breeding grounds by the end of this month. And we are so hopeful and uh, pray them, uh, pray for them uh, to arrive in their breeding grounds safely, just like they did last year. So some more examples. Another uh, gull, a brown-headed gull. So this was named Himakumari. Himakumari is a snow princess. It's, it's a singular meaning because it travels to this uh, snow-covered land and uh, snow covered uh, over the snow covered mountains of Himalayas to arrive uh, in Tibet and to breed there all the way from Mana. So the route that it took uh, fell across Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Telangana, Chhattisgarh, and it then it flew uh, through central Nepal and from there it crossed Himalayas. So this bird was important and this is probably, if I'm correct, the fourth known bird, fourth known satellite tag bird to cross the high altitudes of Himalayas. It flew about 5,000 meters right here between the seventh and eighth highest mountain peaks in the world here in central Nepal. And in the Tibetan plateau, it reached even higher altitudes uh, like 7,000 meters and arrived in this uh, frozen. Uh, salt lake, saline lakes of uh, Tibetan Tattoo and uh, right there. So again, the bird is, the bird was moving through the cities. And here's another example, uh, the Eurasian regions that was tagged in Mana. So this female ended up in Himachal Pradesh in Pongdam Reservoir. So actually, uh, we found that uh, the bird had a uh, fallen off the transmitter and we could collect uh, uh, it we could collect that transmitter uh, last uh, march with the help of the nhs uh, dr satya so indian forest service help us and the, the transmitter is right now with them uh, so it again uh, showed us how mana tag birds how sri lankan tag ducks move it move right across india and arriving north india and this is actually the the Eurasian vision male uh, arriving in Upper Odisha. So, uh, so this, right. So now I have shown you how the birds uh, move through the cities of uh, our flyway. Uh, again, uh, uh, in the broader central, uh, broader Indian uh, subcontinent area. And this is an example to show you how how many tag birds navigate through the towns and cities in Sri Lanka. So here uh, you can see a lesser crested tern tagged here has come down to Putna and a crab plover tagged in Mana, how it flew across uh, the country, flying above the ancient city of Anuradhapura and then uh, arrived in Batiklo and then fly south coast to the south coast of Sri Lanka. And when, it, when the birds were flying north, along uh, its, uh, when uh, the birds were taking its a uh, northward trip, all of them, almost all of them took this route, this, this route that falls across the Jaffna Peninsula. Jaffna is again a big city. So likewise, the birds are moving across cities. So we have witnessed that our satellite tags have shown that. So summarizing uh, everything. So, our tag birds, so specifically our Hughley's gulls, has shown the birds move through cities. So, the Manike and Meg, our tag Hughley's gulls alone, flew over two continents and nine countries and 25 cities, starting from Mana, India, 
then Pakistan, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Russia. So I don't know that whether they were lucky enough or smart enough to navigate across this challenging landscape. You know, all, all of these birds are nocturnal migrants. So they have to have, they have to find their way uh, in a lighter, when the sky is lighted up. So easily they can be disoriented. So it's, it has become challenging for our migrating birds. So let me tell you, what is the problem with the lights? So here's a map showing the worldwide distribution of the artificial light at night, uh, how it overlaps with the, the most widely used migration corridors by the migrants. So the problem is, the, actually the most uh, documented problems with the, uh, with the light pollution, how, how does it affect migrant birds, is the mortality that happens as a result of the collision with illuminated buildings and windows. And also, the seabirds are known to uh, draw, get drawn by the, the artificial light sources in the land, and then uh, they, be they, are, they are lost. So the most uh, prone to this issue is the shear waters and the petrels. So here's an quarry shear water, grounded by artificial lights uh, in Canary Islands. And uh, other than this, uh, they experience more subtle effects as well, like disorientation, alterations in reproductive, by, reproductive physiology, and their circadian rhythms can get disrupted, and their flight behavior can get affected, etc. etc. So, so this is about the global scenario. So when it comes to South Asia, the Indian subcontinent, we know that. So in compared to the, the whole world, we are not as bright as the developed region, but still, when, uh, when our teeth region is taken as a whole, uh, we might, the, other, the intensity of our light pollution might not be that large, but we have, some of our cities are among the most light polluted cities in the world. So the exp exponential population growth and the, the resultant urbanization and the industrialization have caused this transformation. You can see here uh, throughout the last decade from actually 12, 2012 to 2020, how severe the issue has become. So these are the, the states and the cities uh, which uh, affects, uh, which uh, suffers from this uh, the light pollution the most. So would you like to help tackle uh, this challenge, this problem faced by our migrants? Would you turn off the lights for migrating birds? So I'll tell you what we can do as individuals, actually, uh, maybe as a city, as a state, as an organization, what we can do. We can act at different levels, actually. So we can, as an individual, we can turn off unnecessary lights, especially uh, during the peak migration periods, and uh, shielding the outdoor lights and uh, actually encouraging uh, bird-friendly design, uh, bird-friendly building designs in the cities is also a good way uh, to help uh, migratory birds to fly safe at night. So you don't have to wait for your whole city to transform. As an individual, you can make a change. So I'm going to show you, so it's, I have come uh, actually to the end of my presentation. Before I wrap up, I'd like to show you an inspirational video, this is a story about a man called uh, Christian uh, Molek, if I remember correctly. So this is, uh, he has, his single conservation effort has uh, turned into an inspirational, inspirational story that is embraced by uh, many bird lovers around the world. Uh, so. Uh, it does not allow me to play the video. Uh, I don't know why. No. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Garmini. If you have the video separately, you can play it. Ah, okay. I think, uh, yeah. yeah. Is it working, Daniel? Yes, now it's working. Yeah, you can hear, right? Uh, can't hear anything, but we can see the birds flying. 
Oh, are these brand news? Can I share the voice? Can you help me with that? Uh, uh, um, we can just hear you. We cannot hear the system voice. I mean, the video sound. Do you know how I can fix the problem? Uh, um, I do not know that. Oh, Is there any... Uh, actually, Gayamini, I uh, need to uh, make some changes in the audio. audio. So, uh -huh. okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when, you, when you play the video, just uh, go to in the settings and uh, 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 click the audio mode on. So, uh, so, alternatively, you can share the link if you have one in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, we can share the link uh, in chat box. Yeah. Okay, I'll just uh, let it play and uh, I will share the. Okay. Uh, So likewise, we can start small and its impact will never be that small. So with that, I'd like to wrap up my presentation. Uh, and I want to acknowledge all these people. This is, the, this is my team, uh, starting from uh, our principal investigator, my, also my PhD supervisor, Professor Safa Sanivirat, and Professor Kotagama uh, from the University of Colombo and Dr. Tej Mansur of Wetlands International and our beloved Dr. Bala from the NHS. And here's uh, uh, Professor Kao Li of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, our technical partner uh, in our satellite tagging project. And uh, uh, our funders in Sri Lanka, Panamida House Private Limited and Wild Resorts, and of course the Department of Wildlife Conservation. And uh, yes, uh, and that's it. And dim the light for birds. 
happy World Migratory Bird Day to you all. So that's it. Thank you, Garmini. Yeah. One second. I'm sorry, I could not give you that sound. <laughs> Uh, but I'll share the link with you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Garmini. Thank you so much. I think it was a wonderful presentation. So much to learn. Uh, first of all, am I audible to everybody? Yeah. Yes, you Is are. my voice okay? So I think um, just to start with this year's theme, as uh, if you all didn't know, it was uh, light pollution. That's what she focused on in the end. And the best part was she also told us what we can do from our end, because there's always a question of what a common man can do, uh, because you know everybody wants to know what they can do on individual level. And uh, thank you so much for that. And thank you for showing how scientists are studying the migratory birds, especially the understudied uh, Central Asian flyway and uh, the color tagging system, like how different color tags are used for different flyways and also for country-wise uh, regions. Uh, so overall, it was amazing. I'm sure everybody has learned a lot and they yes, have a lot of questions. Do. So what I'll do is now I'll open the session for question answers. I'll open the question, uh, sorry, session for question answers. Mm -hmm. Please, you can either type your questions in the chat or raise your hand. Um, we'll give you all a chance and if somebody is left out, please you can send us your questions and we'll reply them. Does anybody have a question? I think Nagban Swan has raised the hand. So I think. Uh, I'm just sharing the uh, link uh, to that documentary, the small okay. documentary I shared. Uh, it's in the chat right now. We can access. Okay, so we also have one question, Garmini. What I'll do is I'll read because it will be easier for you. Sure. Um, so it says that um, geotagging of birds seems to be very useful in finding the pathways they travel. But what are the prime challenges in getting birds geotagged? Oh, okay, the first, actually, the, the, the most challenging part that we experience is getting the bird that we need. You know, that capturing uh, any bird uh, would not do. You know that we need that specific species and the specific that you know that the, uh, an individual that we capture should be suitable for tagging. Uh, it should be healthy enough uh, and it should be like old enough and it should be ready for migration. So you know that the probability uh, is not so you know it's it's not so uh, like easy to get the the ideal bird. So that is one challenge. And again, uh, you know that when the birds, so it's easier with the bigger birds like ducks, uh, starting from raptors, uh, the ducks, geese, and such birds, it's easier. And uh, the small shorebirds and the songbirds, uh, you know that the tracker has to be proportionately smaller for them. So, you know, again, uh, these kind of small trackers are very, very expensive. So actually in a developing region like us, you and I, we, it's, very hard for us to afford those kind of uh, advanced uh, trackers, advanced devices. So most of the time we have to restrict ourselves to bigger birds. So that is another challenge uh, with the geotype. Uh, and uh, you know, so 100% these trackers won't work again. So if you, if you tag like uh, 100 tags, sometimes only 50 will work. So the others, we can't help it. There are the failures happening and technical failures, uh, all uh, that kind of uh, uh, things. So it's it's a huge investment. But you know, even uh, if, even if only one or two trackers works, that still collects an enormous amount of information and will uh, will help uh, a lot uh, with the to understand them, them better. And uh, we can use this information in prioritizing. Uh, the conservation, much needed conservation action in a region uh, like that in Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. So the second question is, is there any problem faced during the day, like during migration? Uh, during the day, you know that uh, migration is a very costly thing. So starting from uh, natural, uh, uh, I mean, the, there are natural uh, disturbances, like uh, the weather can disturb the birds, and uh, you know that predators can be around for the small migrating birds. And uh, then again, uh, from the anthropogenic causes, so just like uh, night, uh, the night light effects in the cities. So during the day, uh, the birds who who are traveling uh, during the day uh, can uh, suffer from the collisions with buildings, and then again power lines. So a lot of other man-made structures, and again, uh, what happens to it? The 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 when this in the cities, the birds are drawn into lights at night and uh, the urban parks are there right so the so the actually uh, the, the birds will the small song birds they stop over and they start feeding and these uh, urban parks will not be like uh, will not be will not uh, be able to support the whole population of migrating birds so the resources are very limited so they again suffer from those kind of uh, problems so basically, yeah, during the day, uh, yeah, those are the problems uh, that are faced by migrating birds. And of okay, course, hunting you. happens, you know, along the flyway, yes, illegal yeah, hunting. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the next question is by Praveer Bose. He's asking how long the bird covers area and how many kilometers. I think it's, I think it's different for different birds, but still. Uh, yeah. Yes, so for taking Navagals an as an example. So the birds have abilities. So I, I, I told you that the bar headed, the, the bar tail bird with how it flies for 12,000 kilometers within one week. So that much capable birds are there. And uh, uh, the birds like our gulls, they, on average, they fly uh, 300 to 600 kilometers per night. So they, they are nocturnal migrants. So within, it starts like after sunset and by the dawn of the next day, it's there in the destination. So sometimes it continues to fly during the daytime as well. If they have not arrived in the, the destination, uh, in the place that they are going to be, normally uh, that much distance they fly. And the small songbirds, sometimes they fly for like 50 kilometers uh, in one hop. So likewise, exactly like Agi said, it depends on the species. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is by Dr. Vikaspal Singh. I think he's a regular participant for our webinars. Uh, so he's asking, what are the behavioral changes among bird species uh, due to uh, anthropogenic factors like man-made environment, especially during the migration? Is there any specific behavior change due to uh, man-made uh, environment? Behavioral changes. They might shift uh, actually the migrating, uh, the migratory routes. And uh, in case, uh, like, uh, suppose uh, uh, there's a chain of wind turbines built across the uh, across its migratory pathway, so there are a lot of disturbances around. So the birds might uh, not uh, frequently visit to that area as uh, it was earlier. Uh, I think birds uh, can learn. So when they experience, so it's not uh, that, that area is not good enough for them anymore. They stop uh, visiting that area, and uh, maybe they they find alternative areas. But you know that uh, that they 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 are this process of adaptation is very slow. But you know that with all these anthropogenic things, that the man changes things uh, very fastly. Uh, but the birds might not be able to like, adapt to those uh, that fast. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we have two people asking the same question. And I think this was the question that we all had when we started learning about bird migration that we refer to Google Maps and uh, paper maps. But how do birds know where to go and how to migrate? Yes. So actually, I think I uh, little bit uh, of it I explained uh, during my slides. So. As I said, they have they use uh, different mechanisms to find their way along a migration route. 
So they have this inbuilt compost. Actually, the bird's brain, uh, in uh, along with uh, bird's eye and then the ear and even the beak. So they have all different sensors that helps them to sense the earth's magnetism. So actually, I. Now, I, I read that uh, the, the bird's beak, it's, it's very surprising. The bird's beak can help them smell. It helps, help, helps them smell the way across a flyway, just like a dog does. You know, it's called an olfactory map. So that helps the bird to position itself on Earth. So they can actually, they know where the, where the north is. So they know where they are going. So it's like they are having a compound. And again, the, the DNA, genetically, they are programmed. Uh, their DNA is telling them, just like we have Google Maps uh, in our mobile phone, this DNA tells them where to go, which distance, which direction to take, and how long to fly, and then again, where to, where to uh, turn, if they are like, uh, where to turn and where to stop, and again, to stop for how long. Uh, and some, uh, scientists have suggested that birds can recognize landmarks and also um, the birds, the young birds learn in print the sun and the stars. So use this whole of constellation system to navigate uh, between their visioning and breeding grounds that spans uh, that, that, uh, thousands of kilometers away from each other. So yes. anyway, I think that they use actually a combination of it all. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think we also need to be careful because we are changing the habitats every day. So like you said, landmarks might keep on changing for some birds. Even that might be a problem for them. Uh, okay, so next question is, along with migration route, uh, what additional information do scientists look for while tagging birds? Is there anything, uh, other factors? Yes, actually a tracker, as I said, can collect not just its location data, but a whole lot of things like, uh, uh, so it actually depends on the, uh, the performances, how advanced the tracker is. There are trackers that can collect environmental data and we can actually couple with, you know, that we have spatial uh, uh, some uh, weather data. So it maybe we collect it with second resources and we can understand how a bird, uh, with bird movements, how it uh, like associate with different uh, weather patterns, and uh, and then again uh, we collect data uh, on its behavior, uh, how their flight altitudes, that the flying strategies, the migration strategies can change over different uh, the terrain and uh, with altitudes, uh, what kind of uh, strategies they use to uh, overcome the geographical barriers, etc. So, and uh, tagging can be done not just to understand their long distance movement, the, the migration patterns, but a lot of other aspects of birds, uh, physiology, biology, etc. So it depends on your purpose and the performances uh, that of your device. Okay, thank you. And there's one more question. I think one of the last questions. Uh, it's about ethics. So, does tagging harm or irritate the bird? Like, yes, it's actually a, a one of the major questions that is asked by many of the people whenever we talk about tagging. Actually, it's the first question comes to us. Uh, um, it's this time. It's actually the last question. So, uh, uh, tagging. Yes, tagging is a very should be done very carefully you have to go through a whole set of permits and you have to get clearance and again uh, globally there are a set of uh, standards that we adhere to when we are tagging so uh, the the rule is uh, tagging or flagging whatever uh, the rule is that the, the weight of the attachments the tracker and the harness everything should be less than three percent of the bird's body weight so this uh, so again, this kind of uh, the guidelines, this uh, standards has been developed over the years earlier. Uh, in early years, uh, when the satellite tagging was started, that they went for 10% uh, body weight, and but now it has been reduced to 5% of birth body weight. And then now the, uh, the rule of thumb is uh, the, the 
weight should be less than 3% of the body weight. And again, we, when we are tagging, we tag uh, like, uh, uh, like healthy birds and we always check their, the, the fat content, how, uh, like how healthy, how strong enough uh, the bird is, uh, whether it is able to carry a tracker, uh, so etc. etc. So um, I think that's it, yeah. Okay, thank you. So as of now, there are no more questions. Is there anybody else who wants to ask? We can uh, we can ha have one more question and then, okay, one second. Do the birds know the direction where they want to go and stay? Do they assume stars? I think uh, Gayamini answered that question. And... Uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah we did answer the same question and also a lot of people are asking for the ppt and everything so i think we have a youtube channel for bnhs NMIS. we will be uploading the entire session as we have recorded it uh, you can always access that and um, pause whenever you want to and understand whichever slide you want to so anybody else who wants to ask a question or we can just wrap up the session because even Gaiamini is on field. And I think we are just grateful to her that she's doing the session from field. It's um, thank you so much for that. And it was superb. Like even I got to learn so many new things from this. And I'm sure everybody here has been benefited by this session. We look forward to meeting you sometime sooner or later. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, and I also should thank actually Tohina uh, reached me first yeah. and uh, I'm so uh, happy to uh, give this talk today and uh, especially being in the field uh, and uh, World Migratory Bird Days today so and our birds are traveling over you and uh, we should see you all the time so to talk to fellow Indians and the fellow birders in India uh, it's a it's a really amazing opportunity for me too and so Thanks, uh, Gagi, and everyone in the NHS and the NHS and this uh, department uh, for this opportunity. Uh, Thank you. So, yeah, uh, yeah Mr. Uh, Nandakishwar, sir, would you like to add anything? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Garmini. Uh, on behalf of BNHS Envis, uh, we are really uh, thankful to you for giving such a wonderful talk. And I hope uh, the participants have learned a lot. And as Gargi has mentioned, uh, we will upload uh, this video on our YouTube channel. So uh, uh, which which your party will miss you can just uh, 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 pause and learn these things so thank you thank you Gayamini again and thank you uh, Gargi for hosting the today's webinar yeah thank you thank you sir thank you everybody and we'll just end the session here bye Gayamini thank you for bye. today bye. yeah